Hello, everyone. Welcome to this year's Editor's Buzz panel for 2012. Um, I'm John Evans, co-owner of Diesel, a bookstore. Um, we have three stores in California. Every year, every season, certain books will rise to the top of reading lists, be talked about more, reviewed more, change the personal, social, and cultural conversations. Some few more established authors do this all the time, but new authors selected by canny editors will catapult onto the scene. With all the distorting pressures being brought to bear on the stories we hear, political speech, tech talk, corporate media, language jammed into the spaces allotted by devices, it is a wonder, a joy, and a necessity to discover authors resting storytelling from the maws of mental and structural machines and creating distinct revelatory human voices thinking fully human thoughts in the experienced shapeliness of actual human lives. As a bookseller, I see in real time, as we say, the expansive value of these non-fictive and fictive stories on flesh and blood people every day. They testify, giving flash reviews, thank yous, and enthusiastic requests for more. We see children transformed, adults changed, and great books read. But who finds these writers clearly hears the voices in their writing registers the value of what's said, its relevance, takes its measure. Agents obviously do, um, but it is editors who establish a creative relationship with the authors, convince and prepare others to take the risk and then dive into the hard work of further crafting the author's work, readying it for its street date with the eyes, ears, and hearts of readers. Whether delighting, describing, prompting, probing, thrilling, or transforming, the books we might call good have gone through the editing process to become better and even great. There were over 200 books submitted this year for the Buzz panel. The editors of six of this year's Buzz books have been chosen to be on the editor's panel. In alphabetical order, this year's editors are Millicent Bennett, Kendra Harpster, Eli Horowitz, Trish Todd, Alexis Washam, Lauren Ween. Their books are Brain on Fire, My Month of Madness by Susan Cahalan, Free Press, The Pilgrimage of Harold Fry by Rachel Joyce, Random House, A Million Heavens by John Brandon McSweeney's, In the Shadow of the Banyan by Vadi Ratner, Simon & Schuster, The People of Forever Are Not Afraid by Shani Boanju Hogarth, Panorama City by Antoine Wilson, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. I'm excited to present to you over the next hour not only the buzz books of the coming season, but the editors who have helped to bring them to this moment. Please welcome these editors. Thanks. <laughs> Millicent Bennett, um, we have a fascination with stories of fragility and stories of endurance. Editor Millicent Bennett has brought us an engaging new true life tale of one woman's disorienting, elusive, initially undiagnosed slide into madness. Ms. Bennett is a senior editor at Free Press, acquiring the bulk of the imprint's fiction along with select nonfiction titles. Two of the authors she has edited for Free Press are Camilla Lackberg and Brando Skyhorse. Previously at Random House, she edited David Remnick's New Yorker anthology series, Colin McCann's Let the Great World Spin, and Jonathan Meacham's American Lion. Throughout her starred career, she has worked with several of her literary heroes, Russell Banks, Alice Munro, E.L. Doctorow, and Gay Talese. So tell us about Brain on Fire. Hi. Um, so we told John that we would all start with uh, introducing our books by reading the first line. But as you can see, or maybe you can't, um, the, the cover of the book that was going to be up there um, actually isn't our final cover. It's just the first paragraph of the book. So you'll see it on the galleys when you get them in the back. Um, so I thought instead I would start to just tell you how absolutely lucky I feel to be here, not because it's a tremendous honor, which it is, but because this is a book that I very much would have loved to acquire but didn't. Um, in the fall of 2009, in October, I was staring down the barrel of my 10th month of pregnancy. My daughter was due in a week. And I read an incredible article in the New York Post about this young reporter who had had a near-death experience when she had gotten this autoimmune disorder. And it had brought her really to the brink of death. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. 
And as a pregnant woman, I had been doing a lot of thinking about what happens when your body takes over and how terrifying it can be. Um, but reading Susanna's article was very moving for me and it sort of carried me through the next few weeks and it was a real reminder of the fragility of life and the importance of this little family I was in the process of making. Um, so fast forward a couple of years and Susanna's fabulous editor who actually did acquire the book, um, the lovely Hillary Redman, left Free Press and I was delighted to hear that I would be inheriting the book. Um, everyone at Free Press was already crazy about this book from the very beginning, even at that early stage. Um, and as soon as I met Susanna and started editing the manuscript, I could see why. She's incredibly, she's just one of the most lovable people you will ever meet. I hope you all get to see her tomorrow. Um, she's very smart, she's vibrant. It's incredible to imagine that she, you know, the world almost lost this woman. Um, and she had taken what I had read in that original article and made it into so much more. It's a powerful family story and a real inquiry into um, identity and memory. She, um, it, she's done something really amazing in this book and no matter how many times I read it, I can't put it down. Uh, it starts in the spring of 2009 when she's just starting a brand new life in New York City. She's got her new apartment, just started dating a wonderful guy and the New York Post has finally hired her full time as a reporter. And then little things, little bizarre things start to go wrong. She starts um, hallucinating. She starts having mood swings at work. She becomes paranoid that her wonderful boyfriend is somehow cheating on her. Um, and she even becomes convinced that her apartment has bed bugs, which in New York in 2009 maybe isn't so crazy, except that even the exterminator was asking her not to waste any more money. So her parents are worried, but they figure it must just be nerves from her new high pressure lifestyle. Um, and then the seizures begin. Her boyfriend um, finds her one night with her eyes rolled back in her head and blood and foam coming out of her mouth. He rushes her to the emergency room, but uh, they send her home because the, the brain scans and the blood tests are totally normal. Um, over the course of the next week, she begins to deteriorate rapidly. There's um, she has a seizure pretty much every day. By the time her parents finally get her admitted to the hospital, she's in full-blown psychosis. She's violent. She's attacking the nurses. She's trying to convince everyone that her father has killed her stepmother. Um, one of the things that's really, really amazing about this book is the way that her family gathers around her and, um, you know, they're there for her in such a powerful way. She. Um, she and her father had never been particularly close, and less so since her parents' divorce when she was 16. And yet, when he hears she's sick, he drops everything. He turns his back on the rest of his life and basically camps out in the hospital with her. He, she won't let him into her room because she thinks he's a murderer, but he stays outside her door and is just there every day to, to give whatever sort of support he can. She... Um, he, he starts writing a journal about what it's like to watch his only daughter go through this. It's very, very moving to read. And he's not a demonstrative man. He's not talkative. And he's putting down on paper the things he knows he could never say to her. Um, so it, it's amazing to read in the way that he, he, he talks about wanting to give his life for hers. Her boyfriend, too, Stephen, they'd, they'd only been dating a few months. He could easily have walked away. They... Um, you know, her, her, her life is looking a lot like outtakes from The Exorcist at the moment. But he comes and is there every day after work, you know, just working to try and snap her back into who she was. They refused to give up faith that the Susanna that they loved was in there somewhere. The doctors, however, at this point, have done a million dollars worth of tests, literally. Um, and all of the brain scans and all of the blood tests are normal. On paper, Susanna is completely healthy, but in real life, she's headed through psychosis into catatonia. She can no longer, yikes. <laughs> um, she can no longer, you know, eat or drink or speak or walk. Um, she's having, <laughs> um, she's having a lot of trouble, you know, doing anything. Um, and the doctors are ready for you know, they're, they're preparing her family for the idea that whatever is left of her life will be spent in an institution. 
Um, and then finally, Susanna gets her lucky break, and this amazing doctor joins her team who had had some experience with autoimmune disorder. He'd heard of this disease that had been discovered a couple of years earlier, and he makes one very, very lucky guess and saves her life. So there are a huge number of things that are fabulous about this book. You know, her irresistible narrative voice, the fact that it reads like a thriller. Um, but also, you know, she's explored the science behind the disease, this cutting-edge neuroscience. And it's a disease, it's, I won't tell you the whole name because it'll take half an hour, but um, it's an autoimmune encephalitis where her body is basically attacking her brain. And it was discovered in 2007. In 2009, Susanna was the 217th person to have the disease. Uh, and now, three years later, it's in the tens of thousands. They've discovered that a lot of people who... Um, are considered schizophrenic may have this disease. A lot of children who have a kind of violent form of autism may have this disease. It's probably what people had throughout history when they were thought to be possessed by demons. Um, so I have to confess to a certain amount of literary med student syndrome as an editor. No matter what I'm editing, I feel like it's going to happen in my life. So you can only imagine me, you know, late at night working on the manuscript, worrying about every twitch in my body. Um, so I thought perhaps the last piece of information I would leave you all with is that the doctors think this may have all begun when someone sneezed on Susanna on the subway. Oh my God. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope you all enjoy the next three days in a convention center with thousands of other people. <laughs> Um, <laughs> all of the rest of the books on this year's panel are fiction. Um, <laughs> thank God. Um, Kendra Harpster is a senior editor at Random House, where she acquires and edits literary and commercial fiction, as well as narrative nonfiction, by writers such as Brett Anthony Johnston, Susan Burton, Kurt Anderson, Lisa Grunwald, and Nikita Lalwani. That's hard to say. She began her career in 1999 at Doubleday, and in 2006 moved to Viking, where she published fiction by Tana French, Kim Edwards, and Daniel Gannick, among others, already becoming a buzz book for booksellers, The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry is a Sweet Surprise, and a debut novel from British playwright Rachel Joyce. Kendra. Thank you. There's nothing contagious in this book except for extreme admiration and love that I'm sure that you'll all feel once you read it. Um, so starting with the first line, um, actually don't even need to read it. The letter that would change everything arrived on a Tuesday, and so begins Rachel Joyce's irresistible debut novel. The UK has had, had a good, they've been reading this book for the last 10 weeks already. Trans World published on March 15th, and within its first week on sale, it shot to number six on the London Times bestseller list. I've just heard that it's become a bestseller in Germany, and with um, rights sold in more than 30 territories around the world, I think it's going to be a huge international bestseller. So I'm very pleased to bring it to your attention and to bring it to an American audience. Um, we're very excited for it. This is a novel about a retired man named Harold. He you know, sits in his recliner, his lazy chair, um, watching his wife air the curtains, lifting his feet up when she comes around with the vacuum cleaner. And you can imagine that their conversation is stuck somewhere between please pass the jelly and did you really leave the toilet seat up again, Harold? Um, it goes on this way, Harold's pretty lost, until one day the mailman brings a letter. Um, and it's unique because it's a handwritten note. He, it's unexpected, he opens it and reads some devastating news that a friend of his named Queenie is dying 500 miles away in the north of England, he's in the south. And he's moved inexplicably to the reader to immediately write a response, um, which he does. He puts on his shoes and his coat and walks out to mail this letter. And as he's about to put it in the post box, he pauses for a second and thinks, this isn't enough. I have to do something extraordinary. Because maybe if I do something extraordinary, like walk 500 miles to see her, she'll do the extraordinary thing and she will survive. And so Harold goes on an extraordinary, unlikely pilgrimage. Um, I think in order for a book like this to work, your protagonist has to be utterly convincing and, um, and authentic. And in Harold, we really have somebody like that. Um, a bookseller in California wrote to me already to say that he's casting his vote for Harold Fry as the most lovable character in fiction. 
Um, and it's true, there's just really something about Harold. Um, though I'm pretty sure that most of us, if any, perhaps, would be moved to walk 500 miles to see a dying friend. Um, there's just something universal in his actions, and it's immediately understandable and relatable, and you, you go with him and you believe in him. If um, Harold is the, is the star of the show, though, his wife Maureen takes a close second. Through Maureen, we see a portrait of a marriage. Um, at first, she is just angry, beside herself with him, that he has gone and done such a foolish thing. He's not wearing the proper shoes. He doesn't have a map. He has no cell phone, and he's just kind of disappeared without so much as a I'll be back or, you know, or anything. Um, and uh, so she's, she's very angry for a while, um, but she is surprised to discover that this anger, after a few days, gives way to a nostalgia of a time past. She starts to think of the early days of their marriage, the time when they were happy and in love and things made sense between the two of them. And so this novel, The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry, isn't, um, is, is, a nov is a story of a love story in reverse. Um, instead of the disillusion of a marriage, the shattering of this relationship, it's a raveling, it's a coming back together. Because of course the irony that neither one expects and maybe the reader won't expect is that the farther Harold gets from Maureen and the longer she stays at home without him, the more their thoughts just begin to, to coincide and match up with each other. So by the time the end of the novel comes, there is a, a moment so cathartic that really, I mean, most letters that I've gotten so far have admitted to tears or weeping of one sort or another. Um, as, uh, as John mentioned, um, Rachel is an actress. She actually studied with, um, I mean, performed with the Royal Shakespeare Company for more than 20 years. Um, when her children were born, she quit acting and started writing radio plays. Her father became very ill and she thought up this character of Harold Fry and wrote the radio play in tribute to him. He never lived to hear it performed, but this character, probably because of what she had been thinking about in her personal life when she wrote him, really stayed with her, and she spent years um, working on this book, and it is the novel that we have today. Um, we really put um, Rachel through the editorial ringer. Um, we acquired this novel with Transworld, our sister Random House company, um, less than 12 months ago, and with these rapid um, international sales happening you know, within weeks, I mean, we were up to 30, one countries, I think, by Christmas. Um, we knew that the book had to be as tight as possible, and so she worked her, she, she just worked incredibly hard. Um, but I discovered something interesting. As an actor, Rachel understands character in a way I've really never seen a writer speak or think or breathe a character before. In Harold and Maureen and this cast of characters, she, she just knows, she knows things about them off the page that I didn't even know to ask as an editor. And so she's taken this, you know, experience of sitting on the stage in front of, uh, not sitting on the stage, acting on a stage in front of, you know, audiences of hundreds and translated it directly to the page. Um, and it's just produced the most marvelous novel that um, I won't say I've ever worked on, but one of my most memorable. Um, so enough from me. Um, I, you know, there are some of you who I may even be reading your words to you. Um, some booksellers have actually weighed in with what they think so far, and I don't think I could say it any better. So. I'll end with, um, from Mary in Montecito. Harold Fry stole my heart and took it with him for every mile and every page of his unlikely pilgrimage. What a joy to have such a treasure of a book to offer readers. From Stephanie and Fairhope. Harold Fry makes one, sorry, Harold Fry makes one proud to be human. And finally from Pete in Denver. I urge any lover of fiction to take this incredible journey with Mr. Fry. It's one of those rare books where you're reading about the ordinary and somewhere along the line it becomes extraordinary and you put the book down and you think, wow, what was that? Hey, Eli. Hi. Eli Horowitz has edited and designed books and journals for McSweeney's for the past 10 years, working with writers including Nick, Nick Hornby, Michael Chabon, Joyce Carol Oates, Stephen King, William T. Volman, Chris Adrian, Deb Olin Unferth, Salvador Placenia, and Adam Levin. Stylistically pure, startlingly inventive, A Million Heavens by John Brandon is a book that turns heads and hearts. It is a piercing and visionary look at an unlikely array of beings passing through a New Mexico winter, and it's filled with song. Brandon is also the author of the highly acclaimed Citrus County, also from McSweeney's. Thanks. Thanks for having me. These both sound. Uh 
uh, well, amazing and or terrifying, depending. <laughs> I don't really want to use this microphone. It seems <laughs> filthy now. Um, and I didn't know how the panel would go. I thought it might be sort of a Hunger Games thing where four of us ended up slaughtered and the fifth was an Oprah Book Club pick or something. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad it doesn't seem to be like that. Um, Just so I won't wait. try and I won't try and compare with them, but uh, all I can compare it to is, is what I've read of John so far, and uh, and that's easy. We first found John. He found us. It was about six or seven years ago. He sent us his first book, Arkansas. It came in a the manuscript was in a Manila envelope, unsolicited, unagented. We'd never heard of him at the time. He was an itinerant windshield delivery man. Um, but it was a terrific book. We loved it. We worked on it a whole bunch together. We published it. Then we went on tour together. Uh, everyone who read it loved it. Plenty of people never read it. Uh, but that was fine. We had a great time. And it was a terrific book. While we were on that tour, in the minivan, I think it was between Richmond and Asheville on the way to Malaprops, um, he mentioned he was just finishing up his next book somehow, because he is a hardworking man and also an enormously large man. But um, that's irrelevant, proportional, but just tall. <laughs> um, and he, uh, so that was Citrus County. We accepted that. We published it. Um, that was another terrific book. And that one actually got some attention. It had a rave on the cover of the Times Book Review and plenty of nice notices elsewhere. Really a, a terrific book available now in paperback. <laughs> but uh, this one. I gotta tell you, this one's so much better than, than either of those, it's not even funny. Or it or actually is funny, I mean, it's a funny book. It's, a, it's funny and sad and strange and gritty and surreal and familiar and bizarre. It's all these things in this weird brand -y way. It's sort of, it's a, it starts with this piano prodigy, a young boy who's fallen into an inexplicable coma in the midst of a performance. And so he's lying in the hospital, the top floor, in the middle of New Mexico, in the desert. His father's there, helpless, doesn't know what to do, just watches over him. In the parking lot of the hospital, these impromptu vigils start. All these lonely desert dwellers coming together in silence. They look up at the window for a while, mill around the parking lot, disperse every Wednesday back into their disparate lives. There's Cecilia, a young woman who is unwilling or unable to grieve for her dead friend and bandmate, or even for herself. There's her former bandmate, this man Reggie, who's sort of a maybe angel, sort of maybe trapped in the waiting room of heaven, trying to find the songs that will free him. There's a lonely mayor, a sort of a secret romantic, weary of the duties of civic responsibility. There's an angry orphan on the run. There's a gas station owner who wishes he was on the run. There's an old woman with pet chickens. There's this maybe immortal wolf watching over it all, roaming the desert and entranced by the human music. And then, of course, there's the boy, Soren, lying helpless in this hospital room, and his father watching over him, taking quick naps in a chair, knocking out push-ups on the linoleum floor, and just trying to guess at the contents of his son's dreams. And this all, as I say it now, sounds extremely complicated, um, but I assure you it's not. Part of the genius that John has done here is the way these things just sort of effortlessly tumble forward. So we're just seeing these kind of character dramas, which strangely, without you noticing, cohere into this really tautly plotted novel that's almost, I'm going to go ahead and say, a supernatural romance, as, as uncomfortable as that makes me to say out loud. Um, <laughs> but it's a really beautiful, hopeful story. Um, and so this book, I mean, I get it with John. It's, um, you know, I loved all his books, but he's sort of like a Dennis Johnson, Elmore Leonard mashup kind of thing. So there's like swamps and grit and dark humor and ambivalent endings. And uh, they're not really the kind of books you can just drop into any old book club or whatever. But, uh, but this one, I'm just going to say, this book is for everyone. Uh, I don't say that normally. I don't think that all books should be for everyone. But this one is, um, it's sort of, John grew up a little, got actually a job that didn't require moving every three months, had a child, is stable, and sort of finding more space for decency and light and music and hope in his work. Um, 
I feel like I'm rambling kind of quickly, so I'm just going to use this time to very briefly read one passage from the book. I don't know if this is against a rule. Uh, this is where the title comes from. This is Celia, the young woman, talking about her friend, her dead friend, who's sort of been sending songs to her in some sense. Cecilia hadn't received a song for many days now, the longest she'd gone without receiving one. Maybe Reggie had simply run out. Maybe he was doing something else. He might be in a good place. He might have a view of a distant bay full of burnished boats, none of the boats having a thing to do with him, all owned by strangers and visitors. In this place, every person has a strong heart and a share of important work to do. In this place, the future placidly becomes the past. In this place, each person, each person feels the dignified solitude of one engaged in a lost cause. A million heavens waited, a million people scuffling around the desert, hoping not to see their heaven too soon, failing to believe in the afterlives that awaited them and would have them in time, whether they kicked and screamed or closed their eyes and sighed, whether they tried to do good and could not or tried to do bad and succeeded. I mean, John is a beautiful writer. He's an amazing writer, an amazing guy. And in this book, he sort of united that with a... Um, a page-turning plot, a hopeful vision, uh, indelible characters. Uh, it's almost like you sort of locked, uh, let's say, Barbara Kingsolver, Dennis Johnson, maybe a little Vim Vendors, but not boring. I'm sorry, Vim Vendors in the room. Um, <laughs> or any Barbara Kingsolver or Dennis Johnson. Um, I hope you're the only people in the room are you guys. Um, lock them in the room, and they sort of rewrite the movie Ghost. Uh, <laughs> but good in all those ways. Uh, so it's a book that um, I really love. I'm really proud to, be, to have worked on it. I'm basically retiring now, and, uh, and why not? Because there's not going to be a better one after this. So um, I really loved it. I hope you get a chance to read it. And if you do, I'd be, I'd be really excited to talk to you about it. Thanks. Three girls fresh out of high school and straight into the Israeli Defense Forces, growing up in the midst of uh, multi-generational, oh yeah, I was, I'm going out of order, excuse me. Um, you'll have to wait on that one. <laughs> Trish Todd, that's you. Yeah. No. <laughs> Trish Todd joined Simon & Schuster in February 2011 as Vice President, Executive Editor. She publishes a wide range of fiction and nonfiction. At SNS, Trish's first publications included, include Carol Ann Shaw's acclaimed best selling novel, Carry the One, The Rebel Wife by Taylor Polites, and Gilded Age by Claire McMillan. She's also working with Garth Stein on his new novel, Sudden Light, which will be published next year. Prior to joining SNS, Trish worked for 15 years as vice president and editor in chief of Touchstone, where she published. Philippa Gregory, Kathleen Grissom, Susan Rebecca White, and Julia Gregson. Her nonfiction authors at Touchstone included the poet Kenneth Koch, John Lithgow, Ian Van Zant, Al Roker, and Paris Hilton. <laughs> Prior to Touchstone, Trish worked at Dell Publishing, the Berkeley Publishing Group, Pocket Books, and as an agent and publicist. Vadi Ratner faces the true horrors of the Cambodian genocide of the 1970s with this beautiful, poetic, and lyrical novel of pain and survival in the shadow of the banyan. As Chris Cleave writes, a masterpiece utterly heartbreaking and impossibly beautiful. Trish. So, um, in the shadow of the banyan begins with these two lines. War entered my childhood world, not with the blasts of rockets and bombs, but with my father's footsteps as he walked through the hallway, passing my bedroom door towards his. I heard the door open and shut with a soft, so I first read these lines about 15 months ago. Um, it was right before I was going to take a week's vacation in Brooklyn. And Emma Sweeney, the wonderful agent, uh, called and pitched me a novel about a young girl who's coming of age in the Cambodian genocide. Now, Emma, I confess that I wasn't sure this was right for me. Um, it sounded like it would be a tough read, and I thought the hook might be a hard sell. So I sat on my couch on a Sunday afternoon, really just to read 50 pages so that I could write a nice rejection letter to Emma and then I could begin my vacation. Uh, the next thing I remember, it was hours later, and when I tried to stand up, I couldn't. I was so stiff, my joints were so stiff, I remember that feeling very well. I don't think I'd moved a muscle the entire time I'd been reading. Um, 
I've been in publishing more than 30 years, and I knew that I had read what could be the most important book I would ever publish. I also knew I wasn't going on any vacation because a big auction was bound to erupt the following week and I was determined to win it. But first I had to talk to the author and as many of you know this conversation can be kind of hard because you want to be enthusiastic and gush a little bit but you don't want to sound like a blithering idiot either and um, I didn't have to worry about sounding like an idiot because I was rendered speechless uh, by Bidet's response to one of my first questions. When I asked her why she chose to write about her experience in the killing fields of Cambodia as a novel and not a memoir, she told me she wanted to memorialize the people that she loved and lost with a work of art. She succeeded brilliantly, completely on her own, without working in a writer's workshop or with a mentor of any kind. All by herself, she's written a gorgeous and transcendent work of art, taking her horrifying and tragic memories and turning them into this piece of art all by herself. And we at Simon & Schuster feel that this book will sit on the shelf beside books like The Kite Runner and Little Bee and maybe even The Diary of Anne Frank. When we first started talking about this book in-house, I realized that a lot of young people don't know what happened in Cambodia and never, have never even seen the movie The Killing Fields. In 1975, during the Vietnam War, an extreme communist faction called the Khmer Rouge took over the government of Cambodia. And within days, and I mean within days, they evacuated the entire urban population of the country into the countryside and put everyone to work in these rural work camps where they were to be re-educated into a radical communist doctrine. Almost two million people died, and they died of starvation, disease, exhaustion, suicide, torture, and execution. One of the regime's mottos was, to keep you is no benefit, to destroy you, no loss. Memory was considered a disease to be eradicated. Intelligence was reviled, and people who wore glasses were shot. Clothes had to be dyed black because there could be no color. Family ties and love were considered a threat to society. And this regime lasted from 1975 until 1979. In the Shadow of the Banyan is told from the point of view of an eight-year-old girl named Rami. And she's a princess in a minor royal family, and she lives in a flower-filled compound in the capital city of Phnom Penh. Uh, she's had polio, but she's unfettered in her spirit and her love for her family, which includes her mother, who's really beautiful but somewhat remote, her father, who is a poet and a philosopher, her baby, uh, baby sister, who wears silver ankle bracelets with bells on them, uh, her grandmother queen, who's the matriarch of the family, and the devoted servants who care for them. From the start, the writing is lyrical and lush, and it transports the reader to a rich culture in a beautiful foreign land, where rice stalks are as supple as baby's hair, where a farmer has never seen ice, where water buffalo graze on wild morning glories. When Rami's family is swept up in the mass exodus to the countryside, the reader is exposed to events and scenes more tragic than anyone can be expected to bear. But still, Rami finds beauty in blood that is red, glorious, and shining, and even in a baby who has died, and is an incomplete thought, a tracery. A Rami's innocence never wavers. As one of the quotes on the back of the book says, a child takes you by the hand and leads you, and you wouldn't be able to bear it without Rami. As I mentioned, Rami's father is a poet, and he tells Rami's story and stories and recites poems to her. His stories are Cambodian folk tales, and he says they are like footpaths of the gods, connecting us to the whole universe. Being a little girl with a big imagination, Rami loves these stories, and she loves her daddy more than anyone on earth. The family is disguised as peasants because their royal lineage would mark them for certain execution. But when a soldier asks Rami what her father's name is, she innocently reveals it, and he is taken away to a certain death. So for Rami and the reader, her father's stories become a lifeline to him and ultimately to love and hope. As I discovered that Sunday afternoon sitting on my couch, the real hook of Banyan is inspirational. It's about the power of words, of storytelling, of literature to help us transcend suffering and cruelty and loss. Our ability to tell each other stories has the power to heal us and connect us with each other and something greater than ourselves. Rami knows that if you pay close attention, you are never alone, that we are all echoes of each other. Now, Rami's, to Rami, words are the sound of that echo. 
and for us, Bidet Ratner's words show how hope can exist beside despair, innocence beside brutality. If there was ever a book for people who believe in the power of the word, this is it. Bidet Ratner came to the United States when she was 11 years old. She'd been struck mute by what she endured in Cambodia, but she regained her voice, learned to speak English, graduated as valedictorian of her high school class and summa cum laude from Cornell University. She escaped Cambodia with very little else but her memories. She has a picture of her father no bigger than your pinky nail. She has some diamond earrings and a brooch that were hidden in this rice pot. This, this pot has been polished, but it is the very pot the family ate from. They ate their rice from it, and they kept the jewels hidden in the rice as they ate so the soldiers wouldn't find their jewels and they could barter them for things they needed, like food and medicine and mercy. The day brought some of these things with, with her when she first came to visit us at Simon & Schuster, and I've kept the rice pot in my office as a good luck charm for the book and also to remind me what this book means to the day and her family. Like all the books being discussed here today, this book is riding a huge wave of love and support in-house, and that wave has overflowed into the bookselling community and even into the media. We've received really generous support from other authors, including the author of Little B, Chris Cleave, who wrote us a two-and-a-half-page letter explaining why he believes this book is a real masterpiece. If you'd like to meet the day, she'll be in our booth tomorrow around noon. Um, and I want to close with the words of perhaps the most important reader of all, the day's mother, who has read the book and said, I didn't know you've been carrying all this inside you. Rami is as I remember you. You always believe the world was good, even when it stole so much from you. So you may remember three girls fresh out of high school and straight into the Israeli Defense Forces growing up in the midst of a multi-generational war-bound society. This is a braided coming-of-age tale filled with alienation, austerity, honesty, and the bravery of surviving a war-torn adolescence. The voices of the people are not afraid by Shani Boyanju are haunting, coldly touching, and ultimately deeply moving. Alexis Washam is a senior editor at Crown and Hogarth, where she has worked since November 2010. Previously, she was an editor at Penguin, where her authors included Christos Tsiolkas, Sophie Hanna, Randa Jar, and Kristen Hirsch. She has also co-edited books by Sebastian Berry, Julia Alvarez, J.M. Kotze, and Janice Y.K. Lee. The People of Forever Are Not Afraid was chosen by Nicole Krauss, as one of the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 in 2011. She acquires literary and upmarket commercial fiction, narrative nonfiction, and memoir. Alexis. Hi. Thanks, everyone, for letting me be here. Um, I actually wanted to say Eli said earlier that he was worried that this might turn into an episode of The Hunger Games between all of us. And I have to say, I would hope that one of my characters could take my place if that were to turn out, because she would definitely win, hands down. <laughs> Um, I'm thrilled to be here to be telling you guys about an astonishing first novel. This is a book I just can't stop thinking about. As a colleague said to me recently, this book is haunting my dreams. I'll just share the first couple of lines of The People of Forever Are Not Afraid with you. Um, history is almost over. There is dust in this caravan of a classroom, and Mira, the teacher's hair, is fake orange and scorched at the tips. We are seniors now, 17 and we have finished almost all of Israeli history. Now, when I first read those words, I could feel a sort of heat and a restless energy simmering beneath the surface of them, and that feeling didn't let up throughout the rest of that, this book. Um, there's a sense of urgency about it, too. History is almost over. We're standing on the edge of the future with these girls. We're trapped in a high school classroom in a tiny village in northern Israel, listening to the teacher drone on and on, passing notes to our friends to alleviate the crushing boredom of it all. Outside the window, we see hills made of garbage baking in the hot sunlight, and the only cell phone tower in this tiny little town is miles away. With us here are three girls that we'll get to know very well over the course of this novel, Yael, Avishag, and Leah. 
These girls were instantly recognizable to me when I first read this book. They are whip smart, they're rebellious, they're itching for freedom and they're testing their boundaries at every given opportunity. But they're also caught up with pretty typical teenage concerns. They're worried whether the boys who have crushes on them will also, well, actually the boys that they have crushes on will also have crushes on them. And whether or not the party they're about to throw tonight is really gonna be the party of the year. But no matter how familiar these girls seem to me at first glance, I quickly learned how incredibly different their circumstances were from my own. You see, in less than a year, each of them will be conscripted into the Israeli Defense Forces, the Army. They'll spend two years in the hot desert sun, undergoing brutal training regimes, and very possibly going to war. Yael, the loud, flirtatious one of the group, becomes a marksman trainer. She's a better aim than almost anybody else in her crew, so she ends up spending her days teaching boys how to shoot rifles. Avishag is the quiet one of the group. She sort of stands back and observes, so she's put to stand guard at a checkpoint, where she watches as refugees throw themselves at barbed wire fences, every day, day in and day out, in a desperate last ditch effort at freedom. Leah becomes an officer, which suits her bossy personality. She monitors a tedious roadblock in the middle of nowhere. No one ever travels there until one day three Palestinian men show up to stage a protest. So these girls grow up fast. They grow up faster than anyone should ever have to, in a place that has been plagued by violence for its entire history. And when they finish serving in the army, their lives will be forever changed by the experiences they've had. The author of this extraordinary novel, Shani Boyanju, is only 25 years old herself, and just four years ago, she finished her own service in the IDF. But even though she's so young, I'm constantly struck by the level of wisdom and clarity and foresight that she has in this novel. She, her voice has a ferocity and electricity to it that vibrates with the energy of youth, and yet she also has a deep understanding of what it's going to mean for these girls to become adults and how they will be affected by these two years of service. Shani also has a brilliant sense of the surreal, absurd, and sometimes very funny world that her characters inhabit. These girls talk about Tina Fey while they're loading their machine guns and throwing grenades. They sleep in barracks with gas masks on, but the cool girls are drinking nothing but Diet Coke, smoking cigarettes, gossiping about sex, and watching reruns of Dawson's Creek and Ally McBeal. This fusion of youth and pop culture with serious and disturbing military reality is completely unique. I think of this book as Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried meets the movie Mean Girls. <laughs> I think it's the first time that's been used, but we'll see. <laughs> so, um, but Shani's book is really not just about girls and it's not just about the army. It's certainly not a book about war. What the people of Forever Are Not Afraid captures so brilliantly is what it's like to be young, to be fighting to forge an identity for yourself in a world that seems completely unforgiving. It's about being strong and resilient and stubbornly insistent on a future for yourself, about finding joy and hope and humor in places that are completely unlikely and often in life's most terrifying moments. This is Shani's first book, and she's an absolutely extraordinary young woman. As I mentioned earlier, she spent two years herself serving in the IDF, and then she immediately went on to attend Harvard. She wrote this book while she was finishing her senior year in college, and I preempted it just before she graduated. This is also one of the first books that I bought for the Hogarth imprint. Hogarth is a new imprint that we're launching at Crown right now. We're in the midst of an incredible launch, and my colleagues and I there are dedicated to publishing fiction that both informs but also very much entertains by writers who refuse to be ignored. These writers speak in strong, loud voices, and they're passionately engaged with the world around them. The People of Forever Are Not Afraid fit Hogarth's mission perfectly, so it was great to be one of the first books that we bought for this list. After I bought the book, I worked with Shani for a couple of months on polishing the manuscript so we could get it in a perfect shape before we submitted it to international publishers. During that time, I couldn't help but feel like this book kind of belonged to me. These girls were my best friends. I lived in this world with them. I, um, I suffered with them during, in their tear gas training tents, and I wandered around the overly air-conditioned malls that we got to go to on every rare break that we got to go away from the base. I started to worry that the man sitting next to me on the, the bus might be a suicide bomber, because in this girl's world, violence is truly around every corner. I worried that the boy who had won my heart would end up sleeping with my best friend in a weird storage container out in the desert that's supposed to be filled with emergency bullets. That really happens in the book. <laughs> Um, so it was hard to let go of this feeling that this book was mine alone. But um, when Shani's agent submitted the polished manuscript last year on the eve of the Frankfurt Book Fair, it was incredibly gratifying to see 
that um, this book sold in almost 20 countries practically overnight within the course of days. So clearly these girls and their stories were not resonating with just me. Then I found out, as John said earlier, that Nicole Krause had chosen Shani as one of the five under 35 for the National Book Foundation. Shani is the youngest writer to ever receive this award. She's also the first writer whose work had never been published before she was chosen. When Nicole gave her, um, gave her the award, she wrote, even when she is writing about death, Shani Boyanju is more full of life than any young writer I've come across in a long time. And another great writer recently said, Alexander Chi recently said, this is one of the boldest debuts I can think of. It reads like it was written in bullets, tear gas, road flares, and love. When I think of the experience of reading The People of Forever Are Not Afraid for the first time, it's a visceral one. It's almost physical. This book truly grabbed me by my throat and by my heart, and it did not let me go. By the time I finished it, I honestly feel like the way I look at the world had changed. So I can only hope that it will have a similar effect on all of you. We have galleys available. They look really cool, I have to say. And um, I hope one of these days this book will be haunting your dreams as well. Thank you. What happened the first time you read Salinger, or Harper Lee, Melville, Fitzgerald, Lolita? The voices, the intimate, particular, vulnerable, powerful voices. Meet Oppen Porter and add him to the pantheon of distinctly American voices speaking unspoken truths with startling plainness. Panorama City, edited by Lauren Ween, is an unforgettable and transforming book. Lauren Ween joined Houghton Mifflin Harcourt as senior editor in the fall of 2011 after 15 years at Grove Atlantic where she had served as rights director before becoming a full-time editor. Among the writers she has worked with are Francisco Goldman, Stephen Healy, Patricia Engel, and Stephanie Kalos. Before Grove, she studied biblical and modern literature at Cornell. Lauren. I don't really know what I, what I have to add to that, John, but okay. Um, I'm gonna start with the, first, with the first line of Panorama City. If you set aside love and friendship and the bonds of family, luck, religion, and spirituality, the desire to better mankind, and music and art, and hunting and fishing and farming, self-importance, and public and private transportation from buses to bicycles, if you set all that aside, money is what makes the world go around. <laughs> or so it is said. Okay, so right from the beginning, right from that first line, you are grabbed by the humility and the directness of, of this book. This is a novel that puts you back in touch with your childhood self without condescending to your adult self. I dare say it changed my life, and after 15 years in publishing, you forget that there was a time when you could earnestly and unselfconsciously say that, but the fact that I'm up here saying it means that it is true. The voice belongs to Oppen Porter, um, who is six foot five, bicycle riding, binocular toting, self-described slow absorber, which is to say that he processes everything very deliberately and very slowly. He is one of those characters who's sort of like an innocent, sort of naive, um, but, but different than what, what that makes you think of. Um, really slow absorber is the best, is the best way, and, and he came up with it himself. Um, he believes that he's on his deathbed. He's not but um, he thinks he is, and so for the benefit of his unborn son, he speaks into a, a tape recorder, he unspools his life story, um, where he's gone from being the village idiot to becoming a man of the world. Um, so these, you, those are the two main arcs of the book. You, this is a book about legacy, about what we tell our children, um, and it's a book about transformation, about becoming who, who you need to become. This transformation for Oppen has happened during the 40 days and nights before he finds himself on his so-called deathbed um, where he, that he spent in Panorama City. He, he grew up in rural Madera, California with a shut-in eccentric father. So he's, in addition to being this kind of you know, standout character. He's had a very strange upbringing. So the last 40 days and nights, he's been out in the world for the first time, having all sorts of misadventures and, and encounters with all sorts of people. Um, these people are often roadblocks or obstacles on his path because they're, I, 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 I'm not gonna go into who they are, or what they are, but they're fascinating. Um, you think of, it's, it's the kind of suburban, modern suburban strip mall version of like Odysseus running into like, you know, Circe and the Sirens and Calypso and all that. Um, 
but he greets everything with open curiosity and he takes he and and just this incredible openness and he takes in what makes sense for him and rejects what doesn't and it's this refreshing openness and this wit and this naive humor that's never sentimental and never condescending and there are books that are dark and gloomy that just take you down with them and 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 then there are, you know, the ones that are so wide-eyed and so Pollyanna-ish that you want to throw them across the room. Rare is the book that acknowledges the dark and, you know, th the dark side, but then shows you how to come out on the other side um, and shows that the good will always prevail. Oppen's lens on the world, um, the way he parses experience and kind of breaks everything down in this deliberate, pain painstaking way. Um, the way he filters everything down to its most basic elements. It, it tilts everything it just tilts the world back on its axis. I, it defamiliarizes everything. You see things differently while you're reading it and after. It, it, it like gets under your skin and it snaps you awake. Um, you know that there's a Kafka line that when I first heard it, I, it like changed my, my life. And now it's probably on t-shirts and stuff like that. But it's, um, you know, a book should be, um, it should take an ax to the frozen sea within us. Um, and this book absolutely does that. It, it just chips away at the calcifications that happen that, that are just part of growing up, that you know, as you're moving down your path and you kind of realize that it's parting from your own instincts, or your own instincts and your own like, basic essential self, um, this just chips away at that and starts uncovering that a little bit. But I have to tell you that for me, it was a different time. I, <laughs> that, that frozen sea was so unfrozen. It was, it was like I needed it to be a little more frozen. I was. Um, very, you know, I had kind of, I, I was kind of rudderless, I have to say, and I had lost my way. Um, and somehow this book arrived in, on my desk and in my life at exactly the perfect moment. And instead of that ax to the frozen sea, it sort of became raft or encompass all, all in one. And it really led me to the other side. Um, and I know that's a big, embarrassing statement, but it's true. Um, and in part, it's because Oppen is this man-child who's about to become a parent. Um, so he's a seeker who's called, a, called upon to become a guide. And, and, and it's like, how, do you be, how are you so receptive and open to transformation and also an authority um, on something at the same time? And this is a tension that I think we encounter consciously or not consciously throughout our lives. And as an editor in particular, you have to be open to things and you have to be willing to connect to things. Um, but, you know, especially at this moment, and maybe this is the way it is all the time, but at this moment where it's like ebooks and the contraction of our industry and all the stores are shutting down and all these terrible things. It's like, how do you not let that, how do you keep, keep true to your mission? You know, how do you keep looking for the books that you want to publish and how do you do them and, um, and not let in all that other stuff? And I feel like through Oppen, I really kind of, it, it restored the sense that there's a way to fuse the two, that there's a way to be open, but also have like velocity and direction. There's a way of being a grown up without rejecting all that's good and right about childhood. Um, the first quote, quote we got for this book was from Peter Carey, and he said something that I just, I, I felt like very vindicated, because I felt like he had the same experience I did. Um, which he wrote, Panorama City is filled with joy and wonder, and a sort of goodness you would stop believing might even be possible. Um, it's a book that's capacious and versatile, and, and it will meet you where you are. Serious readers will, will understand and love the references to so many books from the canon, like the Bible and mythology and the Odyssey and Mark Twain and Cervantes, um, and others will delight in just this amazing adventure story beautifully and um, just co comically told. And it's, I kind of feel like it goes down like a chocolate milkshake, but it has all the um, you know, health benefits of like a kale lemongrass <laughs> smoothie, you know? Um, <laughs> Antoine himself is, unlike Oppen, he's not 6'5", he doesn't carry binoculars around, he doesn't have the same verbal tics, but like Oppen, he is both philosopher and comedian. He's wonderful. I, I encourage you all to follow him on Twitter and Facebook and his amazing Tumblr feed. He's amazing. Um, and, you know, just to see him out in the world and to see him, like, with his son Leo, is you, you, you just see where Oppen's voice comes from. Um, it is not easy to satirize our world in a way that's, um, enlarging and inspiring and not cutting and undermining. But this book, the, the achievement of this book is that it does just that. Um, it's not a self-help book, it's not religious, um, but without a shred of sentimentality, it can restore your faith in books and yourself and the world. Um, so life-affirming is this book, I have to just say one final behind-the-scenes note and also a word of caution. 
Um, when Antoine was writing it, it's because he was about to become a father, and I think that's probably where the, you know, pr like you're looking at redrawing the boundaries of your life. Um, when I bought the book, I had just come back to work after having had a baby, and I was thinking about, you know, the same things. And the agent who sold me the book, Anna Stein, is not here today because she had a baby this very weekend. <laughs> so I'm telling you, it's really life affirming. Um, <laughs> It's the perfect thing to read when you need a boost, an injection of humor, or you need your faith in, in humanity restored. And, and maybe I've been living in New York too long, or maybe I've been in publishing too long, but that's a lot of people. And there aren't a lot of books that do that. So, thank you. So we have uh, time for one question <laughs> that I'll be asking. Um, you guys ready? Okay. Um, we've just got a little time left, and why not use it since we have them all here? Um, easy for me to say. For each of you, for each of these books, what was the thing that first hooked you? Was it voice or subject, style, language, setting, concept, plot, or idea? What was the most immediate charge that you got from the book that engaged your interest? And we'll go alphabetically because booksellers love the alphabet. So, um, For me, it really was the, the story and the idea that um, the person who was telling this story had gone through all of this, that Susanna, um, who I hadn't yet met in person when I started reading it, um, but nonetheless was so clearly vibrant and alive and, and present on the page um, that she could have come so close to being lost. Um, so it was, I guess, a mix of, of voice and, um, and the story. It was definitely voice and character. Harold is irresistible. Um, and, I, okay, I just said definitely voice and character, but also the idea of this incredible journey. Um, I mean, it, it was just, the whole thing was irresistible. Couldn't put it down. <laughs> Um, this will do nothing to help sell the book or anything, but uh, there were just these sent there was one sentence in particular that really grabbed me and seemed to sum up the way that John can take the simplest things and make them somehow strange. And that sentence was, again, it's not going to help you or me. I apologize. The rabbit looked like a wizard. <laughs> so, read and find out. Uh, for me, it was. Uh the beginning was voice and lyr the lyrical, beautiful writing, and then very soon into the book, the family starts on this journey, and you just cannot stop reading what is going to happen to these people. It is the most amazing thing to think of a whole city being evacuated in a day. It's just, it was amazing. Um, I think for me, it was absolutely the voice. Um, Shani actually grew up speaking both Hebrew and English, and I think that there is an incredible cadence to her language that is unlike anything I've ever read. And as I said during my talk, I think the, the youthfulness and the energy that she brings to her prose is something really, truly like nothing I've ever read before. Um, I think if you had just told me this is a book about war and women in the army, I would have been like, eh, I don't know. But like her voice just caught me from the very beginning. So. Yeah, I definitely need, I'm going to go with voice as well. Um, and I don't know, I, whenever, pe pe agents always say, you know, what are you looking for? And, and my, the, the answer I never give, but the one I'm always thinking is the books that I like most are the ones that kind of ride that line between the life force and the death drive. <laughs> um, and I totally found that in Oppen's voice, that it just both were in there from the beginning. Thanks. Um, thank you all for coming. Please enjoy the show. Thanks to the editors for these great books.